At the house I lived in from three days old until I was 16, I would have strange happenings now and again. I never felt alone there, and I used to see a pale man in a black suit out of the corner of my eye. When I'd look, he'd be gone. Our house was about 110 years old, but remodeled in the 90s. The figure was always vague. He kind of reminded me of Nosferatu. After my brother was born, I was about two. My mom, baby brother, and I were all in a room taking a nap when my mom heard footsteps outside the door and a swish sound with each step. But one of the scariest things that happened to me was when I was home alone sick and I heard footsteps coming from upstairs. I was probably 12 or 13. I sat up on the couch to get a good view of my staircase and saw nothing coming down. I figured it was old house noises or something. Then I went to the kitchen to get myself something to eat. As I was standing there, thinking about food, I felt a hand grab my shoulder. I turned around and screamed, then grabbed a knife and ran outside. I'm sure I was safe, but I'm glad we moved. When I was a child, my parents and I lived in a rugged trailer on the family farm. Shortly after, the farmhands living in the farmhouse that was down a path through the woods moved out, and we had the opportunity to move into an actual house. The trailer we had been living in had no plumbing or HVAC. No shit. We had an outhouse for using the bathroom and showering. We lived like hicks. So at seven years old, I was pretty damn excited to move into a house that had all of those things and a staircase for me to run up and down. It even had a basement. My great grandfather, alongside a good friend, built that house with their bare hands in the 1950s. It was inscribed in a wall down in the basement. To give a little context, this friend of my grandfather's had fallen and hit his head hard on a rock during a snowstorm one night, heading back to the house and had become unconscious. His wife found him hours later and managed to wake him up and help him back home. Later that night, he died. My parents told me when I was much older that strange things began to happen in that house not long after we had moved in. They would wake up to small things like the faucets being turned on in the bathroom or the toilet flushing, the television would turn on in the living room, etc. Then things began to pick up. My mom would wake sometimes to the sound of a man roaring in anger. After inquiring about all these things to my grandfather, they learned of the family friend and his death. They soon learned to coexist with him. It wasn't long before the spirit began to confront me. One of my earliest memories of an encounter with him was when I was eight. It was 2.30 in the morning. I've always been a light sleeper, so when I wake up in the middle of the night, I usually brush it off. But this night, I felt something strange in the air. Downstairs, I began to hear footsteps moving back and forth in the hallway. At first, I thought it was my dad since he sometimes worked a 3 to 11 shift at the steel plant. However, these footsteps didn't seem to be going anywhere, just pacing. Then, after a pause, the footsteps began to make their way up the stairs towards my bedroom. My room was hardwood, so there was a gap under the door so you could see shadows underneath of it. Once the steps made it to the landing outside my door, I could see the shadows of two legs. Next thing, the doorknob began to slowly turn, and then my door slowly creaked open about two inches, just enough for someone to peer through. Suddenly the shadows vanished, and I could see no one through the opening. I decided to be brave and get out of bed to see if anyone was still there. I slowly walked over to the door and threw it open. Nobody. Before moving out of that house, I had many more experiences with our family ghost. I learned that he was friendly and was only coming to check on me that night, and many nights to come. In a way, I miss him and hope that he has found the other side. This is a story from my childhood that has always stuck with me, and I wanted to share it and see what other people think. My family and I had just moved into a new house. This was right after the housing market went way up in the 2000s. So the house we were moving into was a dump because that's all we could afford in our school district. 
It had previously been a crack house. The windows were busted by the police, fence taken down by SWAT, needles in the garbage disposal. Like I said, it was a dump. So my mom and stepdad were fixing it up before we finally moved in. We had a month to get out of the house that we were renting into our new house. My sister's dad would go over after work and paint. We had to because everything was covered with graffiti. He got home one night and said, When I got to the house today, I saw a little kid. This was after they had already replaced the windows so nobody could break in. He said he came into the house and he saw a kid go from one bedroom into the master. So he went to the master bedroom and no one was there. At first, he thought my mom had been there with my sister and I and had left somebody there. When he realized we were not there, he didn't really know what happened. My mom just told him it was fumes and to open a window and wear a mask. Keep in mind, my stepdad isn't the type of person to believe in ghosts or paranormal things, and he doesn't get scared easily, so this was out of character for him. Right after we moved in, almost instantly, my sister had an imaginary friend. Whitney was unusual because she was never a play pretend type of kid. She never played with dolls or anything, she was more of a computer Game Boy tech type of person. She still is today. She was always very logical and thought very scientifically. Even though she was very young at the time, it was just odd because she had never had an imaginary friend before. My mom and I were always the more artistic, wacky ones, and my sister and her dad were more the logical ones. Just to give you some insight. Generally, when a child invents an imaginary friend, it's because they want someone to play with. But her imaginary friend was super annoying, and he was always bothering her. She would constantly complain about Mikey not sharing a toy, or he won't play this game, or he touched my juice. He's not following the rules, not taking turns. Who invents an imaginary friend so they can fight with them all day? One day, my mom was out front talking to our neighbor. She was telling my mom that before the people before us, there was another family there with kids. Then she asked if we ever saw anything weird in the house. She told my mom that the family before saw stuff in the house and that her son, who is now a teenager, when he was little he had an imaginary friend named Mikey. The kids that live in our house before us also played with Mikey and that she had seen him before. My sister and I would spend the weekends with our grandparents and my mom would take the batteries out of all our toys because they would go off randomly when no one was in our rooms. I remember I had a piggy bank that made a noise when you put money into it. One night, it wouldn't stop. So I checked to see if it was jammed, but there was nothing in it so I ended up throwing it away because it wouldn't stop going off in the middle of the night. I had never had problems with sleeping before or after that house. But when we lived there, every morning I would wake up contorted in some way. I would wake up shoved into a little space between my bed and dresser in a ball. And I would always be stuck and my mom would have to help me out in the morning. I would always try to figure out how, but never could. I was in the third or fourth grade at the time and my mom had to put guards on the side of my bed but I would still end up contorted, shoved in between my dresser. This never happened when I would stay at my grandparents. My mom worked a night job and would stay home during the day with my sister. So one night, she came home from work and was washing her hands in the kitchen. From the kitchen, you could see into the living room. My mom turned around because she could feel someone was watching her, and for a split second, there was a kid standing there. She said he looked about eight years old, then he was gone. Not too long after, it was my sister's birthday. After the party, my sister and I went to my grandparents' house. My mom and stepdad were alone. My mom took all the balloons from the party and tied them together and put them in the corner in the living room. So they were watching TV, the air was off because the weather was nice around my sister's birthday, and the fan wasn't on. All of a sudden, all the balloon strings came together like somebody grabbed them, and they floated down about a foot. Then they went around the corner and really slowed down in the hallway. Then once it got to the light in the hallway, the balloons went down and around the light. It went down to the end of the hallway and stopped at my sister's door. My mom and stepdad were watching in shock, not knowing what to do. So my mom decided to talk to it. She said, Hey Mikey, if you want those balloons, you can have them. 
Right when she said that, the balloons went into my sister's room. Now, there used to be a Taco Bell by our house. This was before they started remodeling them, so it looked like a mission. So my mom, my sister, and I were driving past the Taco Bell, and my sister said, Mom, Mikey says that he used to live in a Taco Bell house. We didn't think anything of it. After we had lived there for a while, my mom decided to look into the history of the property. Before it had been a cattle ranch. She then learned that before that, right on the property where our house and three others were, she found out there was a children's mission. It was run by the Catholic Church and they had orphans. That's when it clicked. One year, my sister said, It's Mikey's birthday, we have to have a cake. So my mom made a cake and then she marked it with a little dot on the calendar. Then, when she changed over the calendar, the next year, she marked it with a dot again, just to see. The following year, on the same day, my sister says, It's Mikey's birthday, he wants to have a cake. At Christmas time, my mom went out and bought him a Hot Wheel and a little toy horse. A couple days later, the horse disappeared. My sister didn't touch it, and I had no idea where it went. A couple years later, when we were playing in the backyard, we found it buried in the yard. We brought it back inside and put it on the coffee table, and that night it went missing again, and we still haven't seen it. So, I was a picky eater, and I still am. But my stepdad used to make me stay at the table till I ate all my food. I was also stubborn, so I would sit there till 10 at night, when he would finally just let me go to bed. But every night at that table, I would see shadows walking around the hallway from room to room. I would just think I was seeing things, but it was constantly almost every night. So that's pretty much everything I remember. My mom, sister, and I moved out after my mom and stepdad split. I haven't been back there since. My sister's dad still lives there and she goes there on the weekends. She's in high school now. She still tells me that the house feels heavy and she sees shadow people all the time. But that's it. This happened back in 2012. It was 9.30 a.m. My ex and I pulled up to the post office to grab a money order for rent. As we're pulling into the spot, he slams on the brakes and we both gasp. In the corner spot, perpendicular to us, is a Jeep Wrangler. Sitting in the passenger seat is the most hellish looking man dog I've ever seen. We were both freaking out. It was large. His stature was bigger than your average man. His fur was long and shaggy and brown, but not dark brown. His presence was unsettling to say the least. His eyes were glowing yellow and he was staring right at us. My ex, who at the time claimed to have evil spirits around him often, darted into the post office. I was too curious to walk away, but as soon as I broke eye contact and looked back to the jeep, the hound was gone. I walked all the way around this car. I could see into it. No windows were open, and it was a Wrangler. There was literally nowhere for the man dog to hide. It was wild. It still gives me chill bumps to this day. I'm posting this because I have a story that's happened to me recently, and I can't wrap my head around it. I've come up with all the possibilities I could think of, but nothing seems to suffice. I turned to Reddit because I know there are believers out there, and I know someone must have a story similar to mine. I'm tired of people telling me I'm crazy. This is my story. My friend Adrian and I had to switch cars on this particular day, which was kind of out of the normal. We never switch cars. But I think we were supposed to be together on this night for a reason. The reason I don't know yet though. Also, on this particular day, it just happened to be Friday the 13th and a full super blood moon. Coincidence? Maybe. But these are the only logical explanations I've come up with. Since we had to switch cars on that day, I had to pick Adrian up from work at a local country club in our town. I brought with me my boyfriend's dog, Caesar, who is a French and American bulldog mix. When I picked Adrian up, it was around 10.45 p.m. on a Friday night. Friday and Saturday nights are the main nights for this country club to make money as they are extremely busy all the time on the weekends. 
The country club is called Atlantic City Country Club and it has a long line of history dating back to the 1890s and has been claimed to be haunted. Keep that in mind. As I left the country club with Adrian and Caesar in the car, Adrian had realized that she left her money for the night in the car and then we had to go back and bring it to her work. We stopped at her house prior to get clothes because we are having a sleepover at my house that night. So by the time we got back to the country club, an hour had passed. We arrived at 11.45 p.m. When we arrived, there were no cars in the front parking lot, which was odd. Earlier, when I had picked Adrian up, she had told me that a wedding party was going on and that it was a surprise that she got out so early. The banquet employees, which were additional employees called in, were the main reason why she got to leave early. When we arrived, we pulled up to the front. The country club looked the same, however, you could tell that there was not a soul there from the lack of cars and how quiet it was. A wedding party was going on, so you would think there would be noise in a parking lot filled with cars, but there was not. As we pulled up to the front, she told me to sit in the car while she ran in. When she walked up to the front, the front doors were locked and it was dark inside. At this time, we both heard music coming from the side entrance. However, this music wasn't modern day music. This music sounded like a record player from the 1900s, or at least the 1920s era. We both looked at each other confused. Due to the front being locked, Adrian said she would go to the side entrance where the music was coming from because it sounded like that was where the wedding could be. Before she walked to the side entrance, we both heard what sounded like a bunch of men having a serious discussion among the music. As she walked to the side entrance, I got the feeling in my stomach that I didn't want to be alone. It's almost like the air turned thick and I couldn't breathe. But I thought to myself, we're at a public place where nothing bad could happen. As she walked to the side entrance, I saw her walk to the doors and linger there for a little bit. I saw that she had knocked and waited. I also saw movement behind the blinds in the side area and it looked like a bunch of figures moving around. After this, she came running back to the car in panic. When I asked what was wrong, she had to calm down to tell me. During this time, the dog started getting irritated and what seemed like uncomfortable. Adrian told me that when she had walked up to the doors, she could hear men talking and music in the background. The music was still from the 1900s era. When she knocked on the door, she said the men turned silent, and one man in particular said, Wait a second, who is that? In a serious, creepy tone. A tone as if no one should be there, and they, or whoever it was, was caught. Adrian said she got the feeling that she shouldn't wait around to see who would open the door. Almost like when your sixth sense is so strong that you need to trust your gut and run the hell out of there. And that's what she did. After she told me this, we got extremely freaked out and we decided to go around the corner to the employee lot. To our surprise, there was not a single car in the parking lot except for the company car that's always there. Even more freaked out, we decided to take the back entrance to the main road which goes through the groundskeeper's area. While we were going through the groundskeeper's area, Adrian said she had never seen this area before even though she had worked there for three years. In particular, she said a certain building with a light on that we both saw was a building she had never seen before either. The building was old and run down. This was not a building at a high class modern day country club. We were so freaked out we didn't even stop. What felt like an eternity to get to the main road had only been five minutes. There is no way only five minutes had passed after all of this. At the minimum, at least 30 minutes or so. For the next hour or two, it's all we talked about, trying to come up with a reasonable explanation as to what just happened. This isn't the creepy part. We decided that Adrian was going to text her manager, fellow employees, and the banquet employees to see what was going on the next day. The reason I made this Reddit is because of what happened next. Adrian's manager, other employees, and additional banquet employees all texted her back the next day claiming they didn't even leave the country club until 2 a.m. They also said that the wedding party was so big that there was nowhere to park in all the parking lots and that there were jitneys at the front entrance so people wouldn't drive drunk. When this information was revealed to us, we were speechless. Of course, everyone thought we were lying because they claimed that there was no way we couldn't find anyone or that the doors were locked because there was an overwhelming number of people there that night until 2 a.m. 
The side entrance had also been closed off for remodeling. We were there at 11.45 p.m. to 12.20 a.m. and not a single soul seemed to be there. The only logical explanation seems to be that maybe we entered another dimension or a parallel universe or maybe time lapsed. I don't know and it creeps me out. I think about this every day and I can't come up with an explanation. If anyone has any thoughts or suggestions or even reassurance, it would be great to hear. This happened a few years ago. I was a freshman in high school. Every morning I'd wake up and grab some milk tea and then sit at my favorite chair in the dining room and chill there for 10 minutes before finishing my cup and getting ready for school. So our dining table, at the time, was pushed towards the window. It's rectangular, so at that point only three sides were available to sit at, the other being blocked off by the window. The chair I sat on was pretty much smack dab in the middle of the room, right under our dining room light. Well, the dining room is not really a separate room, it's kind of an open concept. You can see it from our kitchen island. Back to the light. It's not a chandelier, just a dome-shaped simple light with a bulb inside. The dome is screwed on. Anyways, I sit there every single school day. I mean, at that point, this was going on for months, so I mean it, every school day. One morning, I come into the kitchen, pour myself my milk tea, and then I take one step towards the table, but then stop. I swear, there wasn't any ultra-spooky weird feeling. It's weird, though. I felt very nonchalant. I took a step back, and then began drinking my milk tea while leaning against the island and looking at my seat. I don't know why I was staring at the table. I'm a bit of a paranoid person. I always end up facing entrances or exits. But right then my back was to the entrance and I was gazing ahead at the table. A minute later, the light falls down and shatters in the chair. I mean, what the hell? If I sat there, it would have smashed over my head. I really don't know what led me not to sit there that day. I promise, I didn't have any chills or instinctual dread or whatever. Nothing like that. Instead, it felt like I was a video game character and the player just picked B instead of A and that was that. Weird. I don't know. A blessing nonetheless. I never sit under lights anymore though. I've been having a bit of an existential crisis lately and been browsing through these paranormal type subs and thought I'd share a story from 2013 that happened to me. So it was around December 2013 and I was at university studying psychology. I was having a rough patch at the time with my OCD, but certainly no hallucinations or any psychotic symptoms. One of my best friends was studying the same course with me and she would drive both of us to and from the university about an hour's commute. Like I said, it was around December 2013 and I decided to go to the toilet before heading home. We came from a lecture and the building was closing. Every other building was closed except for the main reception area, so I decided to use the toilet in there. It was around 6, 6.30 and the receptionist had already left. A janitor would come and lock the building at around 6.30 onward. So for the backstory, I'm just setting the scene. I head into the reception area and turn to the right to the toilets. There's a heavy fire door and you walk down a long hallway and at the end is a classroom that was empty and locked. On the right side are offices, also no lights on and locked I assume. I have a genetic condition that affects my bones, so I've always used the disabled toilet and I get quite anxious when I have to use the regular ones, I don't know why. So I try to open the disabled toilet and it's locked. I figure no one is in the men's toilet so I decide to use that one. Again, the building is practically closed so I assume no one is going to be in there. I open the door and a silver haired man with a suit on stands there looking at himself in the mirror. I didn't feel frightened but as I went to take a step back he looked at me and smiled and for some reason I backed out and went to close the door. He shouted no and headed towards the door. I shut it fully and went to head back out the fire doors, but then I realized the disabled toilet was open and nobody had come out. The toilets are all within a few feet of each other and there's no way someone could have left that quickly. 
I decided to go back into the men's toilet as I felt silly for backing out scared and when I open the door, I can't see the man anymore. I walk in the toilet and look around and even look in the cubicles and there's no one there. I don't think I even peed. I went out through the fire doors and my friend was there sitting on some chairs. She'd been there the whole time and I asked her if she saw anyone come out of the toilets or anyone leave the building. She says no and I don't want to appear crazy so I don't ask any follow-up questions. It would be impossible for someone to leave any other way. There's only one entrance to the building and my friend was sitting there the entire time.